if we could get into a little bit of your, your background, I know you've got uh, some expertise in mathematics and some background in mathematics, and I'm interested in, in your perspective of that, especially in regard to, to classical education and how to, how to classically train people in, in mathematics. Well, let's, let's, let's get one thing sort of straight from the beginning. Um, I appreciate the question being asked in the context of classical education, because oftentimes we will hear some people say, uh, you know, we want a school that does classical education really well, and we want math and science to be pretty good too. As if to say it's an add-on, right? And it's not. The ancients understood that there were seven liberal arts. And the first three are the arts of language, grammar, logic, and rhetoric, right? And if you understand something about uh, kind of the history and the sim symbolism of numbers, right, as, as, as Catholics, uh, you would understand the symbolic, uh, the symbolism of three is the eternal. And the arts of language are eternal, I would argue, sort of in two ways. One is, if you will, sort of vertically throughout time, right? The laws of logic will always be with us. They don't really develop at all. Uh, they're certainly always true. Um, but they're also, the laws of language uh, are also uh, eternal in a horizontal way, uh, and maybe eternal is not quite the right word there, but what I mean is they reach across all the disciplines. So whether you're teaching history or mathematics or science or language, we're all professional rhetors. So we all need the arts of language. But the other four, the quadrivium, so alongside of the trivium, the other four really are branches of mathematics at least as the Pythagoreans and the other ancients understood it. You know, obviously we have arithmetic, which is the study of, of uh, the discrete quantity. Uh, and then alongside that, geometry, which is the study of shape or continuity, continuous quantity. But they also had astronomy, which sounds to the modern ear like a science, but what they really meant there was geometry in motion. So geometry is a study of the continuous at rest, but astronomy is the study of the, the, the movement of the heavenly bodies, so it's the continuous in motion. But even for them, music related to arithmetic. So arithmetic is the, discuddy, the study of the discrete on its own, whereas music is the study of the discrete in relationship or in ratio to itself. If, you've, if you play guitar or any stringed instrument, you have a sense of you know, various ratios. You cut the string in half to make uh, certain overtones. And so I'm uh, just a passionate advocate for saying, we do classical education, we do the liberal arts, and because of that, we have strong humanities, strong math, and strong science. They are part of what it means to educate a student, right? Um, we are radically incomplete as human beings if we do not learn to think scientifically and to think mathematically. That's, in fact, why we teach mathematics. We don't teach it because it is useful. We teach it because there is something unique in the human soul that can only be satisfied by thinking mathematically. Mm. And the audacious part is, I actually believe that. And so, so what that means is, uh, if that's true, I also believe that if we don't learn to think mathematically, there's something missing in us. There's something crying out to the heavens to understand the nature of the perfect triangle, the nature of prime numbers. Not because they're useful, though they are, but because they are worth knowing in and of themselves. Well, wasn't it Euclid that said something along the lines of um, logic is God's math, right? So we're, we're participating in a mathematical reality that's even beyond ourselves by, by going into logic. And so it reminds me of, I mean, Plato himself thought that for, for the first several years, uh, a student or uh, a mentor ought to work mainly with numbers and, and learn how to do numbers. Why would they be so passionate about that to begin with? Yeah. Uh, in fact, I think because mathematics is the discipline that bridges heaven and earth. Mm because it has an incarnation in the created universe. We know this. So even though I'm a passionate advocate for studying math in and of itself, we also know it has marvelous applications because there is, excuse the pun, continuity, right? Mm -hmm. Between the ideas of mathematics and the creation of the universe. Ratzinger used this as a, a proof, if you will, for the existence of God. Uh, the fact that the human mind, the laws of mathematics and the creative universe all seem to be, uh, they all seem to gel together, means there must be something holding them, right? Uh, something above all three. So mathematics reaches down to earth. We know this. We know that it is the language of creation. But it also reaches up to the heavens because it is not material. Mm. When Euclid is studying the triangle, he is studying a perfect shape that he has never seen. We have never seen the perfect triangle. Anything we've seen in this universe is an approximation of it. I mean, at the very least, you can't draw a perfectly straight line, let alone you can't make something infinitely thin. And yet, 
this pure ideal, this thing of the gods, we can say true things about that. And so mathematics not only reaches down to earth, but reaches up to the heavens. And I think that's why the ancients were so fascinated by it, because they knew it had something to do with this familiar world we live in, but they also knew that it was more pure than all that. It reaches up uh, to, to the gods, and you bring down those ideas, uh, and, and, and you hold them as permanent. And, and that's why math has a higher level of certainty than something like the, the progressive inductive method of, of, of learning and discovering new, new realities in science. Mm -hmm. What would be a classical approach to math versus maybe a modern approach to math? Yeah. What, what are some of the differences? In I'll give you a few highlights. I mean, this is, this is another question where an elevator speech is difficult, right? <laughs> but I think I can say a couple true things about it. So one is, it, it needs to be, math needs to be taught qua math. It needs to be taught as mathematics. And so it cannot be reduced to one of two things. The, the more obvious thing is application, right? So we don't want to reduce the learning of math to application itself, right? This is why even though they're in, and we do actually pair our calculus and our physics together, and there's, there's a lot of good that comes from that, but we caution our teachers in doing that because we don't ever want uh, mathematics to be at the service of the scientific realities. There are things that we should study in math, even if we're not finding parallels in the, the science that's paired along with it. So we don't want to reduce math to application, right? Um, but nor do we want to reduce math to, say, philosophy of math or to the history of math. Now here I want to be careful because I actually do think that a classical approach involves some conversations about what is shape, what is number? What is continuity? What does Euclid mean by a straight line? How does that align with how Descartes conceives of a line as a system of points? We should have those conversations. We also should integrate original sources so that people understand that math is a living discipline that has its own tradition. It's the, 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 the knowledge that we have of mathematics is the product of, of real men and women and their work. So we need, uh, we need history. We need philosophy, but we can't reduce mathematics to that. And we do see some of that tendency sometimes within the classical movement. Outside the classical movement, we see the other tendency. So that's one principle, right? We want to teach math as math for the discipline that it is. The second principle is that we want, as with all classical pedagogies, to, to, produce, uh, to proceed Socratically. And that means starting with the phenomenon itself. Right? So as an analogy, in a science class, cl the classical approach would be to start with the experiment, start with the biological thing, and make observations. We, we don't say, here's the law we're studying today, let's give some details about it, now let's, show you, now let's show you an example of it. We go the other way around. That's true in literature when we start with the book, and it's true in math as well. In math, the thing, the object of study, is, is a problem. You know, it's, it's a thing itself, right? It's, sure. it's a number, uh, it's a shape, but the question surrounding it uh, ends up uh, being, uh, being articulated as a problem. Students, all new mathematics needs to come out of a need, not a practical need, not an application, right? Um, but, but a need for the mathematics itself. Why should I care about factoring polynomials? Like, like really, why should I care about that? It needs to come from some reality, right? It needs to come from some need to discover that new math technique. It's guided by the teacher, but it needs to start with a problem. And that problem, this is not rocket science, right? I'm not talking about a super creative problem that's gonna take all a period to solve. If you want students to learn uh, to factor polynomials, you can simply start off with a quadratic equation uh, and have them try to wrestle with solving that. Because up until that, that point, they will not have had techniques to do that. They need to wrestle with that problem so that they feel the need for the technique. And so every math lesson, every new concept needs to start with a problem. That's true in elementary school, by the way. Even in elementary school where they're in sort of that grammar stage, as Dorothy Sayers would describe it, where we want a lot of technique and memorization, they still should start with a phenomenon. They should start, I would argue, there with a physical object so that they know that the math is grounded in the real and can abstract from it. So this principle of Socratic inquiry, that questioning surrounding an, an object of study, exists from kindergarten all the way up through calculus. 
So that's the second principle that I would adhere to. The third, I guess I kind of already went into in the discussion of, of uh, the content of math, but I do think we need to have original sources in there, right? Mm -hmm. I think we need to understand that mathematics is the result of real men and women, that it has a tradition in the same way that the, the history of ideas has a tradition. Um, the pinnacle of that, of course, comes, uh, at least for us in our geometry class, when we teach them geometry using Euclid's elements.